Good evening and welcome to another edition of Friday Night Jazz here on Vermont Public Radio. Welcome to Stuck in Vermont, brought to you by Seven Days and sponsored by Hotel Vermont and New England Federal Credit Union. We are here in Colchester at Vermont Public Radio, where Reuben Jackson is celebrating five years of hosting Friday Night Jazz. At first, three hours seem really formidable, and now it feels like about 20 minutes. I mean, you really just you get going. Can you tell I'm happy? It's always a great pleasure to share this music with you. And like I say every Friday, I'm so glad to have you hang out with you know uh, this nerdy brother. Uh, but it's true. So it's the CD library. So I just pulled uh, John Coltrane's ballads and Chick Corea's origin. I mean, it's fun knowing you can come in any day and, and just kind of dive into, like stick my head in. <laughs> just, music tapped me on the shoulder very early. You know, I'm like two years old and it's like, Let's go, let's go. My hometown is Washington, D.C. My brother and I grew up in a house where um, music was prevalent. You know, it's kind of like that classic late 50s, I guess middle class American stereotype where you're around the, well, the hi-fi. Some of you all can look the word hi-fi up if you want to, what the heck is he talking about? I used to pretend to be on the radio when I was a kid. I'd take the broomstick and pretend it was a microphone. And this program is really, it's a high tech version of playing records in the basement. Whew. You know, I often say on the air, I'm, I'm your host, Pearson Mary Jackson's musically spitting son, Reuben, and I am. And I, I will forever thank them for um, providing that nurturing environment. I like to say this is a piece in which the urban house party meets French Impressionism. And I try to imagine Claude Debussy asking Brenda Jones from my seventh grade homegrown class to slow dance and Brenda Jones saying, you must be crazy. I came to Vermont in 1975. I went to Goddard College. I'd also gotten the writing bug, like in 10th grade, I was messing around with poetry and creative writing and stuff. And you know, you have to think back 40 some years. I mean, I knew Vermont was a rural state and I understood intellectually like the demographics, but you know, you get off the train at at six in the morning, Montpelier Junction, and, and you're 18 years old. At that time, my hometown, DC is like 70, 75% black. You get off, it's like snow everywhere. You get in the cab, and he's driving, but he's looking in the rearview mirror, and I'm thinking, oh God, this guy. Maybe I'm like the first black passenger he's ever had. And I start to get, we used to say like the willies. I'm getting kind of anxious, like, ooh. You could walk in a restaurant and people wouldn't bother you, but they would all turn simultaneously and just stare. I'm kind of shy like a lot of people in radio. I'm 18, it, it was intimidating. So I think as a black man, I was a double, maybe a triple outside. You know, it's like Goddard, black from the city, I don't know, three strikes, maybe. But I finished, I finished. <laughs> Graduated December 1978 and went back to D.C. Boy, I did a lot of things. I was a children's librarian. I uh, wrote about music for like the Washington Post. I wrote for Downbeat and Jazz Times. Ooh, I worked at the Smithsonian for 20 years with the Duke Ellington Collection. It's like the job of a lifetime. I kind of felt in some ways like coming back here was unfinished business. So I came back to teach in Burlington, Burlington High School. Amazing experience to have Ruben. We all loved him as a class. We threw him a couple surprise parties. He was just a, a, a pleasure to have as a teacher. You know, I've worked with students all around the state. Gives a different perspective to what we've normally had at Burlington. You grew up in a very white community, and we read a lot of poetry, which was awesome. Some of his as well. Like writing for radio is a lot like writing poetry. You have to get to the point. When you're getting that, you know, chicken salad and people kind of careen like this, you think, oh, yep, they know. Like this one said, it's you, it, it, it's that voice. People must, everywhere you go, people must be like, are you? <laughs> yeah, any place, gas station, any place you have to speak, and people will say, I recognize that voice. So it, it's an indicator, of course, that people are listening. And I think the most frightening thing is I told a student about radio is that like either nobody's listening or that somebody is. Radio has changed, but it really hasn't. You know, it, it's still, you know, it's still communication. It's like I'm having a conversation with you and you're not in the same room like we are now, but you are. There's a great degree of intimacy. A woman approached me and she had just lost her husband like two months prior to our meeting. One of the things that gave him comfort toward the end was that 
he would listen to me in, in hospice care and they would listen together. A dairy farmer downstate whose cows like earth, wind, and fire. Couples who have date night and you think, oh gosh, I better not play anything too rowdy here. I'm thankful that people feel comfortable enough to, to share. The kind of community that music can engender, even by way of radio, is, is powerful. Good to see you both. You. All right. Oh, man. Again, a listener stopped me and said, do you think this music helps you like it does me? Which was, I mean, she said it almost just burst into tears. Increasingly, yes. In some ways, what the sound represents is part of a bigger thing. So I said, yeah, maybe we should call it like the saxophones over the mountain <laughs> something you know because it, it kind of it's coming over and i don't know this is an interesting statement just i feel like i'm not in vermont for three hours and i thought wow but i i knew what she meant she happened to be african-american and I, I started thinking is this part of that complexity you know you fly into burlington from wherever and it, vermont looks really simple from the air but it's not it is not at all and for me the biggest step this state could make is to acknowledge that like human beings are capable of great things and we're also capable of not so great things and that racism could possibly exist here as it does in the other 49 states. Some of the, even the most well-meaning people I feel don't understand. When I say how white it is, I don't mean just in terms of numbers, but white is the norm. I have learned a lot about myself being here. It's always good to, as the cliche goes, know thyself. Whew, but it's it's the combo planner. It's the combo planner. Archetypes for for Black American men here are very limited. The fear for some people is that oh, you might be like a drug dealer from Brooklyn. But what if you're like a nerd who loves, you know, like Hemingway and Verity and Muddy Waters, and you don't really fit. And I, I mean, that's been an issue for me throughout life. But I think. Here it can feel more pronounced. I gotta be me. <laughs> Earth and fire's gratitude. I'm oh, just a middle-aged guy looking at <laughs> stuff I like when I had a hairline. <laughs> well, you do represent your race here, whether whether one wants to admit it or not. Here, meaning Vermont, and I mean I'll be 61 in October, and. You take a lot of hits, the constant discussion about diversity and everything, ooh, it, it just wears me out. In some ways, the longer I'm here, the more of an anomaly Vermont feels like, and the more that which raised me kind of clashes. The hyper-visibility of being black here, coupled with, you know, the things we're seeing in the country. When I started teaching, it was like Trayvon Martin happened when I, my first year, and Philando Castile is a gentleman worked in the schools in Minneapolis or St. Paul that uh, shot after an encounter with the police. And I carry, um, I carry these, these young people with me. We have come to the saddest part of Friday evening for me, the time when I have to say goodbye to you. But, you know, all things being equal, we'll tee it up again next Friday, 8 p.m. sharp. And, you know, I know some of you are kind of bashful, but I'll say it anyway. You're invited, okay? Oh my gosh, do I love this? Boy, oh boy, yeah, I do. You know, every week I say I'm glad to have you along for company, because I am. Always a pleasure, have a great weekend, take great care of yourselves, and as my mom was fond of saying, keep your chin up. We'll see you on the radio. You can hear Ruben on Friday Night Jazz every Friday night. <laughs> we will get stuck in room out with you again real soon, in case they can't figure it out from the title. <laughs> Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Sign up for our weekly email. Alerts! <laughs> um, that was really good. My God, you did not bl blub up once. It's what I do. <laughs> it's like it's your job or it's something. what I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can walk in with my eyes closed and I, can, I know where all the nerds are. Like, oh, they're over here. You just feel it. And there's this kinship. And, and they know. They're like, oh, yeah, this guy's a geek. Yeah. <laughs> Geek Emeritus. Where's the jazz, please? Yeah, oh yeah, right. No, we Geek Emeritus, you know. Like.